quickly through um, some of the slides that um, Mary Ferrant presented last year on clinical trial project management. Um, some of it's, you know, obviously for larger scale trials. But uh, let me um, let me share my screen, and then we'll we'll go into sort of questions and answers, and then we can certainly talk about any. Um, subjects that we want to uh, to talk about. So And uh, Joy, you said the recording was going. I'm sorry, I Did missed you hear that. me? <laughs> no, the recording yeah. is going. Okay. Yes. All right, let me share my screen. Yeah, volume's a little low though. Oh, my 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 phone is low. My audio level is low. Medio okay. is saying no. My audio level is 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 okay. Oh, I I I hear you. Sorry, that's better. Thanks. All right. All right. So here are the slides. So everything you wanted to know about trial management. Again, this will be a, a quick high-level overview where I'm going to highlight some of the, the quick points here in, in five, you know, five to ten minutes. Um, this, the, this was put on last year by, by Mary Ferrant, who was the project manager for the very large-scale point trial. Um, which looked at uh, dual antiplatelet therapy for minor stroke and, and TIA, um, and is at UCSF. So um, some of the things that, that, that she wanted to get across, and this is something that, that has been a theme in the CTMC, but understanding you know, issues with regards to the design and conduct of clinical trials, and think about various models for, for keeping yourself organized. I mean, this is a little bit of uh, good advice for people in science and academics in general, and how to conduct a strong trial. I think one of the challenges that uh, many of you have as early phase investigators or early stage investigators is that in addition to um, really being on top of your game with respect to the science, that you are often serving as your own project manager in these early stages in terms of the trial that you're doing, and there is potentially a lot of um, a lot of stuff to think about and a lot of stuff to um, organize and. Um, project management isn't necessarily a, a core competency for for academic physicians. Um, the idea is really, though, that that some of the good foundations of trial management are going to be applicable applicable across large, multi-center, multi-continent trials such as Point, um, and that that thinking of these issues in terms of building out your timelines and your tasks can be uh, really important. Um, again, you know, a lot of this, some of this stuff falls more into the regulatory aspects in terms of trial management, in terms of, of you know, site recruitment and things like that. Again, site recruitment and some of those issues, I think, are things to be looking at down the road, but I think getting your own site your single site trial is a lot of the emphasis of, of our course, knowing that some of some of you are working on multi-site trials. But the, I think this is, is one of the key slides. This is an odd commodity to manage. It's, it is a clinical endeavor dominated by clinicians, many, many of which, many of whom were trained clinically. Um, and, but it, but it also is in certain respects a business that, you have to, you are trying to get to an answer in your trial, and we do love focusing on the, on the science, um, and many of us, um, if we are in academia, the whole idea of the business of a trial is something that is, um, or the business of our personal research enterprise or our department's research enterprise can be uh, something that, that is a little bit obscure to us and something that, that we have to learn about. But, you know, 
you good science is necessary but not sufficient so that is um again something to consider the more and more trials are being done but at, at the same time more and more data is being collected more and more money is being spent but things are getting more and more complex so that is certainly um something that you have to keep your eye on knowing that as there are more regulations and more other trials, sometimes um, you lose sight of trying to be simple and efficient when you ought to be. Um, many more trials are recruiting outside the United States again, and that that is you know that adds to potential complexity with different regulations, different um, other issues. Um, but you know, I think her argument in in her um, in her webinar is, you know, management techniques similar to run similar to what is used to run successful business projects can be applied to how to manage your trial at any phase in the design phase, or the proposal phase, um, and certainly in the implementation phase. So. This is, uh, you know, a quote, project management is a critical aspect of the clinical trial process whose importance in successful trial execution cannot be overstated. And I'm not going to turn you all into good project managers um, with a, you know, our simple office hours today. Um, listening to Mary's talk is not going to make you a great project manager. If you have access to great project managers in the clinical trial space at your institutions or have a pathway where if you perhaps have a, a more junior research assistant who can get mentorship from one of the uh, individuals who's had a longer career in managing uh, projects and managing clinical trials, then that can be a tremendous help to you. Um, but you know this is this is the idea of you know a trial as a project, and a project is a concrete, organized, and temporary endeavor with specific phases designed to produce a unique product, service, or result. And you know, I, I recently took one of those getting things done seminars. That the the book gives you a system for organizing your tasks. And you know, this this the temporary nature of a project is something that is is sort of a key aspect. It has a defined beginning and end. Um, now trials may end early, um, so but they, there will be some bar by which they end. And again, trying to look at those predetermined goals and objectives, again, getting, you know, getting to the application phase, getting to the submission to the IRB or FDA phase, you know, this is consuming resources. And it, a lot of this re resources might be you in the early phase, but I think thinking about how you budget your time and you budget your personal bandwidth, you know, can, can help in, in terms of thinking of your trial as a project and thinking of yourself sort of as a small business. And you have various constituencies and customers who you need to uh, think about. And depending on, and you may have key assets, people who can help you get things organized or work with you to determine how to sequence and inventory what you need to get done. Um, and again, this is this sort of the life cycle approach. You know, you're gonna have, you're gonna create an idea come to a submission, it's going to get reviewed, hopefully it's going to get activated. And again, this might be for using local resources or a pilot grant mechanism at your hospital. There can be, you know, a compression of some of these steps, but, but basically there's this, this life cycle actually is worthwhile for most types of, of clinical trial protocols. The, um, you know, again, these phases, getting the project started, planning how to do the execution of the project, and then make sure that project execution is going well, monitoring the performance and, you know, using your resources well. Cost control can be important if you have, say, a promise from your chair that you can have a year, you know, a research coordinator for a year to, to help do your study, or 50% of a research coordinator for a year, a lot of planning, you want to have a lot of planning go into that before you're into that time because if that person is idling and isn't able to be collecting data and contributing to the success of your, the execution of your project, then you are, that, you know, that's a cost. You're using that, um, it, you know, that individual's time was one of the things that you perhaps negotiated from your chair. And if it's not 
getting you the data and the project execution you need, then you have uh, a challenge. Now, you also have a challenge at the front end, though, in terms of getting to initiation. You need potentially some resources here to get your project even started and planned. So there has to be a balance if you do have resources for um, research uh, coordinators, you know, because because one of the most key things in clinical trial design is your labor force. Um, some of it is you, and, and some of it is going to be potentially people you hire or have access to through your department. So you want to, labor is a, a precious and expensive research or resource, including your own time. Um, so again, thinking of these, these steps and phases. Um, and this is, you know, again, having kind of covered that, you know, and, 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 and some of us are, are in this stage of, of conducting feasibility studies to really get at this idea of what is feasible recruitment, what is a feasible doable protocol, and what are the bars we're going to set to say that my, my single study, my single center study did meet our bars for feasibility and we could now start to plot this out to multiple centers. The um, feasibility can also have different meanings in terms of different phases. If you're planning a, you, if you're an investigator and you're thinking about participating in a multi-center trial, you have to think about your own resources. What resources do you have at your site for doing regulatory submissions? Um, some of that may be reduced now that we have um, single IRBs for multi-center trials, but still there is regulatory compliance and, and paperwork that goes with implementing the protocol. But then also, do you have the resources at your site and will you get the, the resources from per patient payments potentially to feasibly do a trial at your site? And then on the other end, if you're running a multi-center trial or even your own single center trial, it, will you feasibly have the resources and patients to uh, get done what you need to, to get done? Um, again, you know, this is ideas of, you know, study feasibility, site investigator feasibility, how, how have they performed before? And, you know, again, is this a disease that, is, that you have access to the patients from? So, so feasibility, there can be various goals. A lot of our course, in terms of the designs we've been doing for you, we've been focusing on the scientific feasibility aspects, but you can't do the science if you don't have the patients and the right team in place where you would be doing the research. Um, you know, this is look, thinking of this in the multi-center space, but about 15 to 20 percent of sites never enroll a single patient. There are studies of IRB applications from single center investigator initiated studies that show that this number is probably similar um, that of the research protocols that get submitted. Um, it's probably 15 to 20 percent are never going to enroll a single patient. So again, if you've done the right homework in advance, for the feasibility of multiple ends, like I have the people to do this, I have the time, I have the patience, um, then you can hopefully not be in this category. But sometimes new treatments develop, or or you you get into that space, and um, you know that's that is what it is. But it is a potential opportunity cost. So trying to limit your risk of being either a site in a multi-center trial that, and I have done both of these things. I have I have gotten a a protocol approved, and uh, it was so complicated I've never enrolled patients in that study. And as a site in a multi-center trial, I, because of feasibility and technology issues and contracting issues, I was never able to enroll a single patient in um, the MR rescue trial at Michigan because, not because the protocol was bad, but just I underestimated the amount of time where things got tied up in administrative hassles, and then we didn't have um, enough time to do the recruitment. Um, so again, try to learn from the um, wisdom of others and think about things sort of from this perspective of what, you know, coming up with a, a plan in advance so that you can have as much, um, that you de-risk things as much as possible for yourself so that you, have a high likelihood of getting people into your protocol and um, learning from them what you need to do the next study. Um, you know, again, it's it, it, you know, Gantt charts can be potentially helpful. Um, many grant submissions now have a spot, um, particularly for clinical trial uh, submissions, for the study timeline. 
And the more tasks that you actually put onto that, this is this is this planning activity can be useful because when the grant reviewers are seeing these, if you have a very relatively simple study timeline startup where it's like, I'm going to do regulatory for a few months and then I'm going to do this for a few months. Um, you know, that's going to be looked at with, with some degree of, 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 you know, thoughtfulness. But then when you are like, I'm going to be doing all of these special tasks, all of these specific tasks at these times, that can give you a leg up and that can be part of the, the clinical trials NIH applications in terms of the, the study timeline. That's a, a new attachment in that clinical trials section. Um, and again, you know, that's more, some of this is more, you know, formal project management and having a good project manager is definitely important for large multi-center trials. Having access to some resources may be less um, common for you in the early phase, but when you're building out a, a clinical trial budget, even if it's just at your site, thinking about who's going to be helping you stay organized and get through your tasks. Um, since oftentimes as clinicians, we're distracted by our clinics, our other clinical issue, issues, the other research papers that we're trying to get out there. So having research team, including a project manager who can help keep the task going is important. If you don't have that yet, you still want to have some sort of list so you understand where you're making progress and where you might be stalled on things. And, and, and sometimes you can delegate things to others, even if you don't have defined research staff. That Could it be administrative assistants in your department who you can get to help um, work on things, your, your post-award people, pre-award people, um, other research networks, or your, your local CTSA? There are potential resources. Um, so I think the... I think these ideas, since a lot of times I'm going to have investigator as own trial manager in your early phase stuff, thinking about this from the perspective of what are the essential skills for a trial manager? You know, effective communication, number one skill. So both working with uh, your staff, if you're lucky enough to have some, but you're always going to be interacting with others, whether it's patients, IRB, your department, your chair. So being effective as a communicator and, and, you know, advocating for the organization and planning you need. Interpersonal skills, again, recruiting if, if you're in a study where you're going to have the resources to have a project manager who's not you, ability, you know, looking at interpersonal skills, being able to recruit this person who can lead a diverse team across various levels of leadership and can go and be a force multiplier for you to help develop the plan and implement it. Um, experience and organize, played active roles in the management of multiple trials. You know, this is one way where participation on multi-center trials as a site, if you've done your homework and the feasibility is good and you have the right resources to do this, can be extremely helpful to um, learning how to be a good clinical trial manager, both if you have a coordinator who could be participating alongside you, um, in a multi-center trial that is invest, you know, investigator initiated, then that, to me, participating as the site PI for the clearer trial at Michigan was really helpful for me and it was really helpful for, for Ali, who was the project manager at the time, um, in terms of learning how to get a protocol implemented. Um, and then being proactive, anticipating potential issues. I think with that, um, I think that's the main, those are sort of the main points I wanted to make in terms of sharing from the uh, last year's webinar on the topic, which I think was, was quite excellent. Um, at this point in time, I would invite um, the audience in general, um, including any faculty who wanted to uh, weigh in or give out any other thoughts or um, words of wisdom regarding the consideration of, of, of project management and clinical trials. And you can put questions in the chat box too. I'll look for them there. I'll take a sip of water. And in general, I mean, this is, a, you know, this is a tough but important topic, and I think we all can probably be better organized. I can't 
make myself better organized. I can't make you, I can make myself better organized. I can try, but I can't make you all better organized. But I think one of the key messages is trying to plan to get the, you know, the list of things that you need to do in the sequence. Once you have sight of everything that you need to do, then you have a better sense as to, as to everything. And, and sometimes the, um, you know, the, the, the Dr. Wu's time study in terms of how, you know, that, that, that uh, Excel document that sort of lays out how you account for people's time and effort and what they're doing at, at times gives you a bit of a sense of this, so. But I think if there aren't other um, project management focused questions at this time, I can open this up to clinical trials methodology free for all. Oh, I see one thing in the chat box. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would echo that. So that's Dr. Gutman. That communication and a good relationship with your good clinical research coordinator makes all the difference in the world. And I think one of the things that um, it, also, if there is any possibility that they can be in a world where you can connect them with other more senior folks who've done clinical trials, if perhaps the person who's working with you directly doesn't have a lot of clinical trial experience, um, because I think similar to us as, as clinician researchers or biostatisticians, looking to you know, faculty within our department as mentors in clinical research or clinical trials in general, I think having a pathway for your um, research staff to have opportunities for mentorship, both from within your department or within your medical center, and whether these are seminars, networking groups, and you know, encourage them to learn more about project management in the clinical trial space. Um, so Dr. Kirkland's question is, does access to a separate trial manager beyond yourself, the clinician, make your grants application more favorable in the reviewer's eyes? So I think in terms of the budget and the budget justification, I think there are a lot of tasks that involve, you know, the organization of, you know, planning, recruitment, wrangling of sites, if it's, if it's a, you know, if it's a cluster randomized trial that's involving various primary care physician practices, for example, um, having access to somebody with experience in um, trial organization. For me, when I review a grant, that's going to really increase the environment score. Um, at the end of the day, at least in an NIH style grant, the, you know, the approach and that overall impact is important. If it's very clear that you have something that's very complicated, that would be uh, a challenge for you to keep organized and, and on track on your own, um, I think that is something that could, could tend to diminish the approach points if, it's, if, it, if it appears to be inadequately resourced, that you don't have uh, some person who has experience implementing uh, similar studies. So I think access to a separate trial manager can make a grant application more favorable in the reviewer's eyes. Now, depending on the scope and the amount of time, it may be more, um, you know, it, having somebody with experience is, is, gonna, is gonna likely be helpful. Now, is it absolutely necessary for every design of every phase? I think as long as you convey in your grant application that you have resources X, Y, and Z, and here are the, you know, here's how you're gonna access them and, and plan, I think that is, that, that's potentially going to be okay. I think the degree to which you are able to have access to some, but, but I, I guess the, the examples from my own life, I get a lot of emails. Sometimes I'm a little behind on my emails. You may have noticed that all, maybe everybody on this call personally, um, that, that sometimes I'm not the fastest at, at writing to, to emails, but maybe I have a task with respect to a, a subcontract, like my text messaging vendor, that involves a lot of back and forth through a lot of constituencies. And if those constituencies are, are waiting for me to respond, then you know, it's important, but I have a lot of competing demands. I need to assign my charts, I need to go to the ER, I might be on stroke call, I get, I get distracted in a lot of ways. 
Whereas if you have somebody on your team who can continue to, to keep uh, their eye on those issues and making sure the ball is going forward, it can, it can save time. And I think the issue is sometimes if you don't have somebody who's well organized who can help continue to make sure things are moving along, um, you know, as, as, as clinicians, we just are more easily distractible, or at least I am. Um, whereas if you have people who are working for you who are focused on research and, re and your research project, you are um, potentially in a spot where you can have um, additional eyes that will help, you know, sort of help you. Now, if you have competed for and uh, achieved a K award where you're in a space where you have about 75% protected time, you may have quite a bit of, of time and attention that you can be focusing on research, but still there is a benefit to having um, some additional organization. But again, it sort of depends on your study design. If it's very imaging, have, you don't have a lot of project money in K-type grants. So if you, um, you know, need to dedicate more to say imaging or serum assays, then talking up, you know, you have a lot of protected time and here are the people in the, in the, in the department who you are gonna be able to work with um, in the, or your CTSA potentially that can help kind of fill in the gap without having you know, a full-time project manager on your project. But once you, I think you get to the point of you're submitting an R01 to, or a U01 to like an exploratory clinical trial, even at a, even at a, a single site, I think ensuring that you have an adequate um, kind of full-time worker who is, is really focused on keeping things organized. And they may have screening and recruitment responsibilities as well, but they need to have some time, I think, dedicated to the um, overall organization. And again, that becomes one of those things that's a balance. If there's a holdup on something like IRB approval and, you know, this person's on your payroll, um, you're, you know, you're spending money on your grant and they're not able to get the things done. So having that overarching plan to make sure the things come into place at the right times um, is, is, is important. Um, so it's, it's like uh, I, I, President Eisenhower said, you know, plans are useless, but planning is essential. So, you know, the actual process of figuring out everything that you need to do is the important activity. The written document can be helpful as a guide, but a lot of times things will need to be adapted and you need to pivot. So the plan itself as a piece of paper is not as important as the time that went into annotating all those tasks that you needed to do. Those are very good questions, very thoughtful. Um, all right, so then this is the open-ended, anything you wanted to ask about clinical trials, or any, anything you wanted to know about clinical trials but were afraid to ask before, I think we'll, we'll open things up in general to the, uh, to the audience in the, in, the, in the chat box. And now I'll try to take a sip of water while we wait for something. Or, and, and again, I think you should be able to, um, Joy, can we, we could, un, have we muted everybody? We could, people could unmute themselves, right? Correct, they, they, they can unmute themselves. I can unmute all those as well if you want. So I think, um, you know, at least in, in my small group, we've been continuing to make some, some good progress. Um, hopefully everybody is continuing to make progress. Are there any questions about the potential submissions to the mock review panel? And I guess, I, I, you know, in the absence of a question, I will wanna say, you know, we're trying to lower your barriers to entry on that. We want people to, you know, if, if, if they're in a place where they have a, a really a serviceable 
design concept at this point, which I think most people do, along with um, you know the specific aims and the beginnings of the you know uh, research approach. Um, again, we would we we you know, our um, focus in the in the potential in the mock review panel will be to to get you feedback on that the approach stuff. Um, again. Other aspects that are important, whether it's, uh, say, a career development mechanism, either at NIH or AAN, um, those are things that we will we will comment on if we're comfortable. But mostly, we want to make sure you get the good aspects of the clinical trial design and the clinical trial um, experiments uh, as clearly communicated as as possible. So, Dr. Conway has a good question, um, and I don't have a good way to estimate it in a non, um, I mean, I can have people raise their hands except for I can't see all the people on the screen. The, uh, I guess, if you, if you are planning on submitting to the mock study section, maybe you could send a chat message, <laughs> just click a chat message, unless you're on the phone. If, if you're on the telephone itself, then it doesn't look like anybody's purely on the telephone. So, but I think that's, that's, that's good. Yeah, and for those of you who are gonna be doing early submissions, that's great, and we'll, you know, again, what the, the way that we're probably going to be operationalizing that is if you need some feedback early, we'll get you written feedback in the first phase, and then we will, you know, it may be harder to, to it may be harder to handle, but at least give you some feedback that you can hopefully use for your submission before we have the, the actual event in November, but if you want to submit a revised, if you after you get your, let's say you're submitting to a grant that's due on October 1st, we get you some, you know, you say, hey, I need feedback by September 24th. And we say, okay, we'll do our best. We'll try to pass it along to one of our faculty who can get it on a short turnaround. And then we will um, try to get you some written feedback to say that you get it a week before that that, that is due on October 1st. So after we've done that, um, we will check with you to see if you want um, to have us do a little bit more of a deeper evaluation of it where we get a second reviewer and have it just go into the mock study section in November and get some additional feedback afterwards. Or if there's any adjustments you made to your grant for its final submission, you could um, just submit a revised, you could submit a revised version that's the final version of what you submitted to your local mechanism, and we could just give you some additional feedback on what the final version was. Again, hopefully it will be, um, it will be funded, and, um, and hopefully we won't tell you the opposite of whatever the reviewers from that mechanism tell you. Um, but I think if you've gone through that, if, if we've sent it, if you send it in early, we'll be in touch with you about getting some preliminary written feedback on the, the on the, the approach and or potentially the significance. And then if you want to get a final version kind of to sort of replace that based on our feedback, that would be great, but we can also work off of what you initially submitted if it's, if there's a, if a lot of it is the same. Oh, that's a, that's a good point. We did, in, in terms of, Thinking about how clinical trials were reviewed, we did have in the early years of the grant of the clinical trials methodology course, we did have an exercise where we did a mock IRB section where we thought about the clinical trial protocol with respect to the ethics and protection of human subjects over and above what would be typically discussed in a grant review. We will, um, the grant, when we do our mock study section reviews, we will think about it from the perspective of whether the human subject section is um, acceptable if it was provided. And it's potentially optional for the uh, mock study sections. So um, 
one of the one of the things about the the IRB review that was good was the idea was to hopefully give people some early feedback on some of the maybe human subjects issues that they hadn't considered as 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 strongly. So um, happy to you know, we, we, that's something we may think about doing again in future years. Um, but for those of you who who will get to a point where you can include the human subjects section of your grant, um, I think that will be potentially helpful because that is something that is is looked at in the NIH grant review process. And if there are deficiencies there, they can hold up funding for otherwise very scientifically meritorious projects. And sometimes, and if they're severe enough, they can factor into the approach and how, how a reviewer is going to score the approach. So. All right, well, I think at this point, um, I don't have anything else. Joy, was there any other announcements that, that you wanted to make? Well, I think at, at this point in time, um, keep up the good work. Don't hesitate to, to contact us if you have other questions. And if you are doing one of those early submissions, please get the, the documents into the portal um, as and, uh, along with an email letting us know that they've just been uploaded there and then we'll try to distribute things out um, through our executive committee. Um, again, pleasure chatting with you all this afternoon and we will talk to you soon.